Level 0. You're standing in your backyard on a clear night, looking up at what seems like a thousand tiny pinpricks of light. They all look the same, don't they? Little white dots scattered across the black. But here's what'll mess with your head. Every single one of those dots is a massive nuclear furnace. And the smallest ones, the ones you can't even see, might outlive the universe itself. Red dwarfs are the most common type of star in existence, making up about 75% of all stars in the Milky Way. Yet not a single one is visible to the naked eye from Earth because they're all too dim. These are the smallest true stars, ranging from about 0.075 to 0.5 solar masses, barely large enough to sustain nuclear fusion in their cores. Red dwarfs are violent, temperamental stars. They produce stellar flares, massive eruptions of radiation that can be thousands of times more powerful than anything our sun throws out. These flares happen constantly, unpredictably, bathing any nearby planets in lethal doses of X-rays and ultraviolet radiation. Yet here's the paradox. Because red dwarfs burn hydrogen so slowly and efficiently, they can live for trillions of years. Trillions. The universe isn't even old enough yet for a single red dwarf to have died of old age. While every other star in the galaxy burns out and dies, red dwarfs will still be glowing, hosting the last possible refugees for life in a cold, dying universe. Their incredible longevity means that long after our sun has expanded into a red giant and consumed the inner planets, these tiny stars will continue burning, unchanged, preserving whatever worlds orbit them in an otherwise dead cosmos. But red dwarfs at least made it. They crossed the threshold. Before them, the universe creates something far more awkward, objects that almost become stars and fail. Level 1. Brown dwarfs are the universe's reject pile. They're too big to be planets, but too small to be stars. Stuck in an embarrassing middle ground where they tried to ignite fusion in their cores and just couldn't. These objects form the same way stars do, collapsing from clouds of gas and dust. But they don't accumulate enough mass to trigger the sustained hydrogen fusion that defines a true star. They need to be at least 75, 80 times Jupiter's mass to cross that threshold. Brown dwarfs fall short, typically ranging from 13 to 75 Jupiter masses, which sounds huge until you realize Jupiter is already 318 times Earth's mass and still nowhere close to being a star. What they can do is fuse deuterium, a heavier isotope of hydrogen, but only for a brief period after formation. Then they're done. They spend the rest of their existence slowly cooling off, radiating away the heat from their formation over billions of years. They glow dimly in infrared, invisible to the naked eye, drifting through space like dying embers. The smallest brown dwarf ever discovered, 2 mass J052313403, is only about 90 times Jupiter's mass and has a surface temperature cooler than a cup of coffee around 135 degrees Fahrenheit. There are probably billions of these failed stars scattered throughout the galaxy, too dim to see, occupying the shadows between the worlds we can detect. They represent a cosmic near-miss, objects that came tantalizingly close to stardom but fell just short of the critical mass needed to sustain the fusion reactions that define a true star. But step up from these failures and you reach the star that makes everything possible, the stable, predictable furnace that allows life to ask questions about the universe. Level 2. G-type stars like our sun occupy the sweet spot. Not too big, not too small, burning steadily for billions of years with just enough stability to allow complex life to evolve on orbiting planets. Our sun sits almost exactly in the middle of its life cycle. It's been fusing hydrogen into helium in its core for 4.6 billion years, and it has about 5 billion more to go before things get weird. Right now, it's stable, predictable, the kind of star you can build a civilization around without worrying it'll suddenly flare up and cook your planet. One million Earths could fit inside it. Surface temperature, about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Core temperature, 27 million degrees. It's converting 600 million tons of hydrogen into helium every single second through nuclear fusion. And that process releases enough energy to make life possible on a rock 93 million miles away. But here's the uncomfortable truth. Our sun is average, boringly, beautifully average. The sun contains 99.86% of all the mass in the solar system. Yet there are stars out there that could swallow the sun whole and barely notice. This mediocrity is actually what makes our sun special. It provides the long-term stability necessary for complex chemistry to evolve into biology. For single cells to become civilizations capable of contemplating their own cosmic insignificance. Because once a star grows heavier than the sun, calm disappears, and the universe replaces stability with violence. Level 3. 
Now we're talking about stars that don't play by the comfortable rules. Blue giants are massive, hot, and absolutely ferocious. These stars typically range from 10 to 100 solar masses, burning so intensely that their surface temperatures exceed 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit, more than five times hotter than the sun. That extreme heat shifts their light into the blue end of the spectrum, giving them their name and making them some of the brightest objects in the galaxy. But here's the trade-off for all that power. Blue giants burn through their fuel ridiculously fast. While the sun will live for 10 billion years, a blue giant might only last 10 to 20 million years before exhausting its hydrogen. Eventually, it runs out of options. The core collapses and the star explodes in a supernova, briefly outshining entire galaxies and scattering the heavy elements necessary for planets and life across space. Every atom in your body heavier than hydrogen was forged in the core of a dying star like this. These are the cosmic factories, the engines that enrich the galaxy with the building blocks of everything, but they're reckless, violent, living fast and dying in the most dramatic way possible. Their brilliant blue light can be seen from millions of light years away, marking regions of active star formation where massive clouds of gas are collapsing into new stellar systems at an astronomical rate. Even blue giants have limits. Beyond them exist stars so extreme they're constantly tearing themselves apart just to stay alive. Level 4 we're entering territory now where size becomes almost incomprehensible. Hypergiants are among the rarest and most extreme stars in the universe, with masses ranging from 100 to over 250 solar masses. They're so massive that they're constantly on the edge of tearing themselves apart. Take Eta Carinae, a hypergiant located about 7,500 light years away in the Carina Nebula. It's estimated to be around 100, 150 solar masses and puts out 5 million times more light than the Sun. In the 1840s, it underwent an eruption called the Great Eruption, briefly becoming the second brightest star in the night sky despite being thousands of light years away. During that outburst, it ejected material equivalent to several solar masses, creating the stunning homunculus nebula that surrounds it today. Hypergiants exist in a precarious balance. Their immense gravity tries to crush them inward, while the furious nuclear fusion in their cores pushes outward with radiation pressure. The radiation is so intense that it physically blows the outer layers of the star away in powerful stellar winds, shedding mass constantly. They're essentially bleeding to death, losing material into space while still trying to hold themselves together. These stars don't follow the normal rules of stellar evolution. They're so unstable that they can vary wildly in brightness, sometimes dimming and brightening over periods of decades. Some hypergiants are surrounded by thick shells of ejected gas and dust. And when they die, they don't just go supernova. Some hypergiants are so massive that when their cores collapse, they skip the supernova phase entirely and collapse directly into a black hole. Others explode with such violence that they're classified as hypernovae, releasing more energy in a few seconds than the sun will produce in its entire 10 billion year lifetime. Astronomers estimate there are fewer than several dozen hypergiants in our entire galaxy, making them among the rarest stellar objects we can observe. When these giants run out of fuel, they don't shrink, they swell, and in doing so, they become vast, unstable, and dangerously close to collapse. Level 5. Betelgeuse. If you know one red supergiant, it's probably Betelgeuse, the red star marking Orion's shoulder. And for good reason, it's one of the largest stars we can see with the naked eye, and it's dying. Red supergiants form when massive stars exhaust the hydrogen in their cores and begin fusing heavier elements. The core contracts and heats up, but the outer layers expand dramatically, cooling as they spread out into space. The result is a star that's enormous in volume but relatively cool in temperature, glowing red instead of blue or yellow. Betelgeuse has a radius about 900 times larger than the Sun. If you placed it at the center of our solar system, its surface would extend past the orbit of Mars, swallowing Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars entirely. Yet despite its size, it's only about 10, 20 solar masses. It's a balloon, a vast shell of gas held together by gravity. The star is unstable, pulsating irregularly, brightening and dimming over periods of months and years. Other red supergiants are even larger. Antares, Voicanis Majoris, Musephi. These are stars with radii exceeding 1,000 solar radii, stars so large that light takes hours to travel from one side to the other. Some of these stars can swallow entire solar system, yet even they are not the largest the universe has managed to create. The surface gravity on these enormous stars is surprisingly weak. You could theoretically stand on the surface and weigh less than you do on Earth, despite being surrounded by a mass many times that of our Sun. This counterintuitive fact demonstrates just how diffuse and tenuous 
these stellar giants actually are. Because at the absolute edge of stellar physics, there exist objects so vast they challenge our ability to comprehend scale itself. Level 6, Stevenson 2, 18, UI Scooty. These names don't mean much to most people, but they represent the largest known stars in the universe, objects so vast that they challenge our ability to comprehend scale. Stevenson 2, 18 is currently considered the largest known star by radius, a red supergiant located about 19,000 light years away in the constellation Scutum. Its radius is estimated at around 2,150 solar radii, meaning if you replace the Sun with Stevenson 2, 18, its surface would extend past the orbit of Saturn. To put that in perspective, light traveling at 186,000 miles per second takes about 8.7 hours to travel from one side of Stevenson 2, 18 to the other. You could fit nearly 10 billion suns inside its volume. These stars are in their final death throes. They've exhausted most of their fuel and are ejecting their outer layers into space through powerful stellar winds, creating vast nebulae around themselves. Eventually, the core will collapse, triggering a supernova, and the star will vanish. The stellar winds from these behemoths carry away mass equivalent to Earth's mass every few years, slowly dismantling the star from the outside while the core continues its relentless march toward gravitational collapse and the inevitable explosive finale that awaits. When stars like these finally collapse, size stops mattering. What's left behind is something far denser, stranger, and more extreme. Level 7 white dwarfs, neutron stars. These aren't stars in the traditional sense. They're what's left after stars die, the corpses of stellar evolution. And they're some of the strangest objects in the universe. When a sun-like star exhausts its fuel, it ejects its outer layers and leaves behind its core, a white dwarf. These objects are about the size of Earth, but contain roughly the mass of the sun. That means they're incredibly dense, about one million times denser than water. A teaspoon of white dwarf material would weigh about 15 tons. White dwarfs don't produce energy through fusion anymore. They just sit there, slowly cooling off over trillions of years, radiating away their residual heat. But white dwarfs are nothing compared to neutron stars. When a massive star goes supernova, if the core is between about 1.4 and 3 solar masses, it collapses into a neutron star, an object roughly 12 miles in diameter but containing more mass than the sun. The density is so extreme that protons and electrons are crushed together into neutrons, and a teaspoon of neutron star material would weigh about 10 million tons. The surface of a neutron star is smooth, hard as diamond, with gravity so intense that if you dropped an object from one meter above the surface, it would hit at millions of miles per hour. What's left behind is a stellar corpse compressed beyond imagination. Dense, violent, extreme. Some neutron stars spin hundreds of times per second, their intense magnetic fields beaming radiation into space like cosmic lighthouses. These pulsars were once mistaken for alien signals when first discovered. Their regularity seemed too perfect to be natural. Push collapses just a little further, and the universe creates an object so dense that space and time themselves surrender. Level 8. When the core of a dying massive star exceeds about three solar masses, nothing can stop the collapse. Not electron degeneracy pressure, not neutron degeneracy pressure. Gravity wins absolutely, crushing the core into a singularity, a point of infinite density, and creating a black hole. Black holes aren't stars. They're regions of space-time where gravity is so strong that not even light can escape. The boundary around a black hole, the point of no return, is called the event horizon, and crossing it means you're gone forever. Stellar mass black holes formed from individual dying stars range from about 3 to 100 solar masses. Cygnus X1, one of the first black holes ever discovered, is about 15 solar masses invisible except for the X-rays emitted by gas spiraling into it from a companion star. But stellar mass black holes are just the beginning. At the centers of galaxies, there are supermassive black holes, monsters containing millions or even billions of solar masses. Sagittarius A, the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, is about 4 million solar masses. And then there's the extreme end, the black hole at the center of galaxy M87, which weighs about 6.5 billion solar masses. Its event horizon is larger than our entire solar system. If you fell into a black hole, you'd experience spaghettification. The tidal forces would stretch you into a long, thin strand of atoms as the gravity difference between your head and feet became insurmountable. Time itself would behave strangely. To an outside observer, you'd appear to freeze at the event horizon your image slowly fading and red shifting into invisibility over billions of years. But even these cosmic monsters have competition. Theoretical giants from the early universe that make modern black holes look ordinary. Level 9. Population 3 stars. The very first stars that ever existed. 
They formed in a universe that had never seen starlight before, in conditions so different from today that they could grow to sizes we can barely imagine. These stars had no heavy elements because none existed yet. The Big Bang produced only hydrogen, helium, and trace amounts of lithium. Without heavier elements to help cool collapsing gas clouds, these primordial stars could accumulate enormous masses before igniting fusion. Current models suggest they ranged from 100 to 1,000 solar masses, giants that dwarf even the most massive stars we see today. They burned with furious intensity, surface temperatures exceeding 100,000 degrees Fahrenheit, making them appear brilliant blue-white. But their lifespans were incredibly short, perhaps only 2 to 3 million years before they exhausted their fuel. When they died, they didn't go quietly. The most massive Population 3 stars experienced pair instability supernova, explosions so violent that they completely obliterated the star, leaving nothing behind. No remnants, no black hole, just total annihilation. These explosions released more energy than a billion normal supernovae, briefly outshining their entire galaxy. These ancient giants seeded the universe with the first heavy elements, carbon, oxygen, iron, making all subsequent generations of stars, planets, and eventually life possible. We are literally made from the ashes of these primordial titans. Every breath you take, every thought you have, every cell in your body exists because these ancient monsters lived, burned brilliantly, and died spectacularly in the universe's infancy. But Population 3 stars, as massive as they were, at least followed the rules of stellar physics. There's one more theoretical extreme. Objects so bizarre they shouldn't exist at all. Level 10. Welcome to the edge of theoretical physics, where the universe might have created quasi-stars, objects that defy every intuitive understanding of what a star should be. Imagine this. In the chaotic early universe, a massive cloud of gas begins collapsing. But instead of forming a normal star, a black hole forms at the center first. Normally, that would be the end. The black hole would consume everything. But if the gas envelope is massive enough, something strange happens. The black hole's accretion disk releases so much radiation that it supports the surrounding envelope of gas, preventing further collapse. What you get is a star powered not by nuclear fusion, but by a black hole. The outer envelope continues to feed the black hole, which continues to radiate energy, which continues to support the envelope. A self-sustaining cosmic paradox. Quasi-stars could have been 10,000 solar masses or larger, with radii exceeding 10 billion kilometers, large enough that their surface would extend beyond the orbit of Neptune. If you replaced our sun with a quasi-star, its outer layers would swallow every planet in the solar system. These objects would have been unstable, lasting only one to two million years before the black hole consumed enough of the envelope to disrupt the balance. When they finally collapsed, they would have left behind intermediate mass black holes weighing thousands of solar masses, objects we still struggle to explain today. Current models suggest the absolute maximum mass for any star-like object is around 10,000, 15,000 solar masses. Beyond that, the radiation pressure from the central energy source would blow the object apart faster than gravity could hold it together. If physics allows something beyond this, the universe has almost certainly already built it.